My name is Greg Story. I'm a graduate of Griffith University in the Modern Asian Studies faculty, ended in 1975. I am the president of Dale Kennedy Training Japan. Um, the first thing, Greg, can you just tell us about Dale Cunningham Training Japan? Let me talk a little bit about Dale Cunningham Training Japan. This is actually the 51st year for Dale Cunningham Training to be in Japan. So that's quite a long time as a foreign training company. We're a corporate training company, and we cover a number of areas around sales, leadership, management, presentation skills, uh, process improvement, those types of things. And we serve both domestic Japanese companies and foreign companies who are based here in Japan. Our main aim, though, is to help people to boost their careers and companies to boost their performance through the ability of the people working for them to be more capable and more productive. Is um, Dale Carnegie training just in Japan or is it a global enterprise? Dale Carnegie is not just in Japan. It is actually in more than 90 countries around the world. There are, in fact, it's a franchise organization, so there are 190 franchises around the world. We actually teach in more than 30 languages across those 90 countries. Now, Dale Cunningham Training's objective for our clients is actually quite a difficult objective. It's behavior change on the part of the participants of our training because you can get the training, watch the TED lecture, read the book, you know, get the article, but you don't do anything with it. This is the nexus where we really have to break through and help people to use what they learn in the training and apply it into their careers, into their jobs, into their companies, so that there's an outcome that is something that's viable for both the company and the individual. Are you able to explain briefly how that process works? How you're able to effectively change behavior? Yeah, it's the behavior change piece is quite complex. It's not something that's so easy to do, otherwise everyone would be doing it. But Dale Cunningham is quite specific around that. We have 250 hours of training required for our trainers to become certified. That is a huge amount of training. And the reason for that is because what we do is rather complex. Self-discovery is a big piece of it. When you own the information, you tend to use it more. So we spend a lot of time drawing out of people, more the Socratic method of drawing out of people things they already know or making clear things which they haven't quite really gelled for them yet. That is really the job of the instructors. It's quite, it's a hard task, I have to tell you. Being an instructor myself, I know how hard that is. That's one part of it. The other part is we do lots of interactive work. It's a very, very fast-paced training methodology. Japan loves lecture. Old-style Japan training is the teacher, lectures, lectures, lectures. You just sit there passively taking notes. This is quite different. This is highly interactive. Uh, lots of getting up and, and talking, uh, presenting, uh, self-designing, group work, that type of thing. So for Japan, it's quite a modern, different style of training than what the Japanese traditional companies would offer. Why is the training you do, uh, Dale Carnegie training, so critical in Japan? The current thing with Japan with training is most people in the traditional style in Japanese companies rely on what they call OJT, which is on-the-job training, which means that your seniors teach you everything you need to know. Well, if you've got a really hot group of seniors in the company, your upper directors or your senior leadership are really on the ball and they're the ones coaching you, fantastic, that's great. But if they're mediocre, which in most parts in Japan, unfortunately, they are, uh, then you've got a bit of a problem there about what's the source. You know, what's the source? What's the, uh, what's the curriculum base for what they're teaching? And it's pretty thin. So really, Japan has been through a lot in the last 20, 30 years with downturns in the economy, earthquakes, etc. you know, radioactive uh, power stations blowing up. There's been a lot going on. So it really has got to a point where on-the-job training has seen its last legs. They need to have new management ideas, new training ideas to reinvigorate the companies, to go to the next level. And that is what they are seeking from us. President of, of Dale Carnegie Training, what does your day-to-day -day role involve? Mm. As the president of Dale Carnegie Training in Japan, we are a small company, relatively, you know, compared to most of the big Japanese companies. So, as the president in a small company, you're doing everything, basically. But primarily, my job is strategy, of course, looking for the direction for the company, 
I spent a lot of time too uh, working with the marketing team because for us as a foreign entity in Japan, uh, getting the message out, getting Japanese companies to know that we're here, I mean, particularly they know the brand name. Dale Carnegie is a fantastically strong brand name in Japan, but to know the detail of what we do or to know the full extent of what we can do is not so easy. So we have to really spend a lot of time uh, working with the marketing team to get that out. I have a director of training who takes care of training quality, so uh, I work with him very closely, of course, but that's his primary responsibility. And also, I do what we call in Japan top sales. Top sales is a Japanese term taken from English, which means that the president is also a salesperson. So for a lot of uh, my opportunities are with fellow presidents, so it's much easier for someone with my relative rank to get to meet the president of a, of a Japanese company or a foreign company, to have that access. And so I have the opportunity myself to also present the company and to sell our training into those companies. What do trainers do on a daily basis for us? Well, we have two varieties, if I can use that word, of trainers. We have one group who have their full-time jobs. They've been sent to the course or they've read the book, the How to Win Friends and Influence People, and they've come to the training and they love it. And they come through the course and they are just totally committed to it. And they love it so much, they want to teach it. So for them, they've got their career and it's really benefiting their career, but they want to be involved with Dale Carnegie. So weekends and nights, they would, they would train for us. Then we've got the other group. These are people who've got their own small training company. They may have some existing curriculum from somewhere else and they're looking for more opportunities to teach. So they will come and do that 250 hours. It doesn't matter which variety you're in. You still have to do the 250 hours of training to certify. And they will then come in and take our classes, become certified, and then they will teach for us uh, on a contract basis as we need them. So we will have uh, a client with a particular need, uh, it might be a retail client, for example, and we'll have one of our trainers who comes from a retail background uh, who's gone through the training, and they might want leadership. So we're looking for someone who teaches leadership for us, retail background, and we will match that trainer with that particular client. And the other big thing, is it doesn't matter, uh, again, which group you're coming from, you must have run a business. You must have run a business. Because if you said to me, look, uh, I've been doing training for 10 years, I've been internal training for my company, I want to train for Dale Carnegie in Japan, sadly, we'd have to refuse. We'd say, I'm sorry. Uh, unless you've run a business, we can't use you. Because what we want are business people who we then train to be trainers. Because in that classroom environment, your ability to be empathetic with what people are talking about, to understand the issues, to add that little bit of extra from your experience is immensely important. That's what we're really looking for. What, uh, what are the biggest challenges? I might do this in two parts, actually. What are the biggest challenges that Dale Carnegie Training faces here in Japan? We think about what are the biggest challenges for Dale Carnegie Training in Japan. I talked a little bit before about one of my key roles was looking after the marketing area. And that is really, I think, one of the the break points for us, we've done quite well in the last few years with the English-speaking uh, foreign community, what we call the Geishke, the uh, foreign corporates here, and getting our brand name recognition really working well. We're very, very well known now in that group. It's the bigger Japanese market, which is a little bit harder to crack, and well, one of the obvious reasons for that is money, because advertising to the foreign corporate community here, there's a limited uh, group of media, which you can use for that, and so it's not that expensive. The Japanese media, though, you're talking, you're talking major money here. So it uh, makes you take a bit of a pause of the breath when you look at what you've got to spend, but that's what you've got to do. You've got to try and get in there. So we've been doing a lot with our business social media, with our YouTube channel, with our online uh, area, trying to penetrate into that market. But at some point, you know, you're going to spend money, and that's where, to get that brain awareness, you've got to get into those right magazines, uh, getting that type of media, but it is very, very expensive. What about for you personally? What are the biggest challenges you face um, as, as president of the company? Yeah, and for me as the as the president, what are the key challenges for me? Uh, it's keeping things in balance. I think you know, as a again a small company, you have to invest to grow, uh, but your investment means money's out the door today, and the money will come back in, but the money comes back in later. So in that between the money going out and the money coming back in period, uh, it's hard. You know, that's the hard part. Cash flow, managing cash flow, managing that investment, uh, bringing new people on to grow the business. Because Dale Carnegie 
is a particular philosophy. It's his whole 30 principles of human relations that we're based the whole company around. So we have to interact with each other as role models for those principles. We have to interact with our vendors. We have to interact with our clients. We have to interact with everybody in that way. So it's a little bit more demanding than just being a company. You're a company with a purpose. You're a company with a philosophy. You're a company with a set of very clear guiding principles. So I have to keep all of that very much to the forefront because we are the brand through how we live those principles. So I have to make sure the people I hire and the way we run the company reflects the beliefs that we have about how people should interact with each other based on what he's outlined in the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. What are the specific challenges Japan throws up for the organization as opposed to other Dale Carnegie training in other countries? I think scale for us is one of the issues. It's a little bit different as a challenge to other countries. If you think about uh, those 190 franchises that I spoke about before, many of them are relatively smallish territories because Dalkani started in North America, you see, and so they managed to, to carve those territories up into relatively smaller sections. We're covering all of Japan, so it's a very big market. I mean, from where we're sitting, if you get up high enough and you look around the sort of horizon for 30 kilometers, you're sitting, you know, 30 million people. And that's just where we're sitting. And then you've got the whole country, 127 million people. So trying to penetrate such a big, competitive, you know, well-heeled market, not that easy. Uh, we have lots of competitors, lots and lots of competitors, from the very big players down to the one man, one woman bands. So how do you break through? How do you break through all that noise? I think for us, that is one of the critical issues. And part of it is quality, uh, part of it is consistency. Again, it's a very thin pipe through which we draw our trainer team. And so they are, they are the elite. They are the Rolls Royce of trainers in Japan. And that gets attention. So word of mouth very important, reputation very important, and then as I said before, trying to uh, get that message out through our ability to use the media, uh, use paid media to do that. Um, with your particular role, what do you love most about it? Well, if you'd ask me what's my most favourite part of my role uh, running this company, I guess uh, I personally love the challenge. I, I love building things. I love uh, trying new things, I love experimenting. So in all the roles I've had in my career today, whether it was with uh, Austrade, setting up a new operation in Nagoya from zero, uh, whether it was coming to uh, work in the Shinsei Bank, uh, going into retail banking with no banking background particularly and, and turning that around, uh, coming into the National Australia Bank and trying to broaden the range of things we did there, they're all very great challenges for me. Uh, and coming into Dale Carnegie as well, it's again, it's another one of those very major challenges of building the company, building a reputation, establishing the brand in, in particular pockets that don't know the brand, um, building the people within the team. There's lots and lots of layers to running a company, but it's that challenge factor that gets me up every morning and looking forward to coming to work. And I'm, I'm a permanent student or a perpetual student. I have never stopped studying. And, I think uh, you know, when I was at university, sometimes my fellow students say, oh, I can't wait to get out of here, I don't have to study anymore. Well, what you find when you get out of university is, well, you keep studying, it never stops. It never stops, and in business, if you're not learning, you're not studying, you're losing. And so for me, uh, I'm constantly, I'm on, I'm on the iPod all the time, listening to podcasts, I'm reading, I'm constantly looking at videos. I never stop because the world is changing so quickly, the world of business is changing so quickly in Japan. Japan moves at a fast pace. This is probably the fastest moving business environment on the planet. So you've got to be in the front of that. Why is Dale Carnegie training so right for Japan right now? Yeah, why is Dale Carnegie the right thing for Japan at this particular point in time? Well, I think we bring a couple of things to the party here that uh, local companies don't have. We're global. And globalization is a big issue in Japan right now because they decline in population. So many Japanese companies are saying, well, our market's not going to expand. We've got to go outside. And uh, I was in Sydney last week, and I see a Uniqlo pop-up store there, and they've opened in Melbourne. And that's a good example of Japanese companies moving out of Japan because they know the market here is declining. But the point is the people who are moving with those companies outside of Japan are not global. So you've got this dichotomy or this irony or this contradiction of they must become global, but the people working in the companies are not global. 
We are both local and global. When I say local, we are 51 years in Japan, and there aren't probably too many of our competitors on the ground here in Japan amongst the Japanese domestics uh, in the training business who have been here 51 years. And we are also global, and we are across 90 countries, but we've been doing this for 102 years. So we've got this immense background, this immense proven system for we're using, which for I think for any client in Japan is the best of both worlds. Briefly, how you came to be here in Japan doing what you do. Briefly, as your agents, anyway, it's a long journey. Well, how did I wind up in Japan? You know, why am I running uh, my own company in Tokyo as an Aussie, as a boy from Brisbane? Well, I originally had a very strong interest in, and still have a very strong interest in martial arts. I've been doing Japanese traditional karate now for 42 years, and I started as a 17 year old in Brisbane, and I found something very perplexing. My Japanese teachers had a completely different way of looking at things for me. And that's my first real hard, close experience with a cultural gap with Japan. And I realized, oh my god, if I'm going to master this art, I have to understand the Japanese way of thinking. And there's only one way I'm going to do that. I've got to get to Japan. So I had this sort of burning interest and desire about learning more about Japan. And then uh, I got a, a scholarship to study. I was very fortunate. Uh, Goff with them. Thanks, Goff. Uh, when they brought in the no fees policy for students back in the 70s, that allowed me the opportunity to go to university. I'd been working, uh, I'd been working in offices and I went labouring for a number of years to put the money together to go to university and then with the no fees policy it enabled me to do that. And I chose Griffith because they had this faculty called Modern Asian Studies. Now, in those days, if you did Asian studies, you probably did antiquities or you did literature. You certainly didn't do anything which was current. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, Asia, particularly if you were growing up in Queensland, where we had a very close relationship with Japan, probably more than the rest of Australia, maybe bar Western Australia. And so you had a very Japan orientation in your mind as you're growing up there. And I thought, well, Asia's the future. And Japan at that stage was definitely the leading country in Asia. I think in many regards still is amongst the leaders. And so I thought, well, this is where I'll start. Now, if they'd had international business, I would have probably chosen international business. And the faculty has now become part of the National Business Faculty, but in those days it was modern Asian studies. And so what a revelation that was. You know, as a young person, I was 21 by the time I got to university, and my professors, they were often in their first job of teaching. They'd come back from Asia, many of them, passionate, passionate people, fired up. They were, they were just, oh, they were so real about Asia. They were passionate about helping us. And because of Griffith's uh, sort of mentality around but professors were called on a first name basis. So you didn't feel that barrier, you didn't feel that status, you didn't feel that hierarchy that maybe in a traditional you know, university you'd have. So you felt close to your professors and they were so encouraging, they, they inspired us and uh, I was so inspired by them. Uh, I wanted to become a professor myself, I thought wow, what a great job. Get, imagine being paid to learn all day, how good is this? I want to do that. So once I start on that path then you go through a uh, certain a certain set of steps, and one of them is to do honours in those days, to a master's, and do a PhD. And I, I started on that route, and I was very fortunate. I got a Monbusho, which is the Japanese Education Department scholarship, to come to Japan to study in 1979, and it was a very, very different Tokyo than what it is in, uh, today. Back in 1979, I studied at George University, Sophia University, and uh, started on that path. And eventually, I did a master's degree there. I came back as a Japan Foundation fellow. Uh, to do my field work for my doctorate. I did my doctorate, I went back to Griffith, I finished my doctorate. And then I didn't become a professor. <laughs> I didn't get into academic life. I started on that path, I almost got there, but I got swept up into business. I uh, kept on getting these phone calls from everyone, you know, hey, Greg, you know, you've been in Japan, you speak Japanese, uh, I want to buy something from Japan, I want to sell something from Japan, uh, to Japan. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I started my own company, I started my consulting company, and I, I started helping people to interact with Japan, and in that process I became well known in Brisbane, and I got then headhunted by what is now called Joe's Lang LaSalle to help them with their Japan business, and once I got into business I loved it, I thought, wow, I'll go back to academic life, I'll get there, you know, I'll get, I haven't got there yet, I'll get there. But uh, I never went back. And so I stayed with business and it just got more and more interesting. And then, so one of those challenges I had was actually starting an operation on the ground from zero in 1992 for Austrade. And that was the big attraction for me to join Austrade because 
Back in 92, I mean, you could count the number of Australians who opened up a brand new operation on the ground in Japan on the figures of one hand, maybe. And so, what a fantastic opportunity I thought that would be. So, opened up with Paul Keating's help, the Prime Minister of Australia came to open our consulate in uh, Nagoya, because it was a consulate and trade commission office in, in two, two, uh, two parts there. Did that, and then four years later, had the opportunity to move to Osaka, and actually John Howard came through and uh, spent time with us in Osaka at that time. I came back to Tokyo in the embassy in 2001 as minister in the embassy, and eventually I left the embassy and joined Shinsei Bank. Now, Shinsei Bank is a private Japanese retail bank, and I joined the retail bank part of that company, I should say. And that was, again, a very big experience because I was brought in for my expertise around running sales teams. If they wanted someone who knew how to turn sales teams around, they said, look, we've got 300 salespeople here, we're getting nowhere, come in and fix it. Again, love that challenge. So I did that. That was great, did that. And then I got headhunted. Uh, I got a call from Corn Ferry, and this was a job going in the National Australia Bank. Uh, why don't you have a look at that? And I thought, wow, I'm running National Australia Bank in Japan, that'll be great, I'll do that. So I applied, I got the job, and that was, you know, that was again a roller coaster, very challenging. But, you know, at that stage also, I think I'd sort of had enough of corporate life. Uh, I thought, well, you know, Matrix organizations are a bit of a challenge. Someone in another country is pulling the strings on what you're doing. It's a bit tiring after a while. And I thought, okay, why don't I work for myself? And so this opportunity came up with the franchise in Japan, Vidal Carnegie, and I thought, well, uh, I'll grab that and run my own business on the ground here. And that's, again, that's been a phenomenal challenge. So I think the challenge aspect has been something central to my career and also combining all the things I like, you know, which is being international, being in Japan, uh, being uh, involved with helping people, um, all those things are the things I enjoy. Back to um, Griffith, what did you think you would do when you first started Asian Studies with Griffith? Yeah, I thought at that stage I would probably uh, start my own company uh, to do with uh, Japan or I would work for a company that was dealing with Japan. That was sort of where I was going. And then as it turned out, in that first year that I joined, uh, we all studied uh, Mandarin studied Putonghua and so the reason for that was the Japanese instructors were arriving the following year so I sort of started uh, in Chinese and I thought well you know geez I, I want to do Japanese but I've got to go back and you know drop out a semester here sort of didn't fit so I'll keep going in Chinese or Japanese later you know the, the uh, typical optimism of youth somehow that'll happen but for me it did happen I did get that chance to do both so in terms of my research later what I did was looking at becoming an academic I was able to combine both language sources of Chinese and Japanese in my study of Sino-Japanese relations. So, and again, I chose that field because it gave me the opportunity to combine both. But I, as I say, it was probably after my first year that I realized, wow, I want to be an academic. These professors are just like rock stars for me. And I just love what they're doing. I love, I love that passion. I love that knowledge. It's just great. I want to be like them. And so that was really the inspiration to go in academic life. Are there any other significant changes between when you, where your head was at when you went in and when you actually came out of this stuff? Yeah, the changes for me uh, on the way through uh, undergraduate life, I think, was my first year particularly. I, you know, I'd literally been in a trench with a shovel in my hand on Friday uh, working as a labourer. And then on Monday, uh, I was you know, wearing a t-shirt, shorts, and uh, at university. So I'd spent four years working to get there. So I was a mature age student. I'd come through that, that vein to get into uh, modern Asian studies. And, you know, I'm with all these really smart kids, you know. I call them kids at 17, 18, I was 21. And they've come straight through school. They're used to studying. I'm not used to studying. And I, I remember what a struggle that first year was. I'd have to have the dictionary next to me because I'm reading the textbooks and all these big words and I, I couldn't understand what they were. So, you know, I have to read, what's this mean? Oh, it was such a start. Looking out the window, and Griffith University, all these, you know, floor to ceiling windows, a beautiful blue sky outside. I spent the last two years outside working as a labourer, outdoors, love that life. I'm under fluorescent lights inside, it's killing me, you know. But at the end of the second, sorry, first year, second semester, we got our results. You see, it was a full year of results. You didn't get any results in your first uh, semester, you got right to the end. And as I was getting my results, uh, Professor Ho Pan Yok, who was the, uh, the dean of the faculty at that time, said to me, uh, Greg, you finished in the top 5%. Wow. 
couldn't believe it. I thought they were going to kick me out. I thought I'd failed. I thought, I'm not good enough to be here. Boy, what a turning point that was. When he told me that, I said, I can do this. And not only can I do it, I can be at the top. And from that moment on, I just tripled my efforts. I just became a machine. So for the next, you know, four years, or well, another three years, I should say, including honours, I just put my hand down and went for it. And that's where I really started to decide, I'm serious about this, I want to be a leader in the, you know, as it turned out, the Sino-Japanese relations field globally. But that, that trigger point for me was a really big turning point. Are there any other critical turning points in your studies or in your career? Yeah, I met a, a professor, John Wellfield, who'd uh, come, he'd come in, uh, I think it was by the second semester of the first year, or possibly first semester of the second year, I can't remember now. And he's your fully fledged genius. The man is a genius, honestly. And his lectures were just so, so challenging and so mind boggling and so learned. And he really inspired me too to be an academic. And I saw how he could combine information into new ways and bring knowledge out of those combinations and insight and, and angles, I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. So that was, again, a big turning point for me, to, particularly on the Japan area. I, I really wanted to you know, grow up and be like him type of thing. You know? And so that also encouraged me. I, I wasn't studying Japanese language at that point, but I was studying Chinese, which was challenging enough, thank you very much. Um, but it sort of did provide a base for me later when I started to study Japanese here in Japan. And I guess you know, coming to Japan, that was a big turning point because Again, that culture shock I talked before about with the Japanese uh, senseis, the Japanese karate masters, uh, just magnified that a hundredfold on the ground here. You know, everything was just so different. And it, I'm a very determined but also stubborn <laughs> person, so I found you know, trying to adjust to something so radically different was very challenging for me. And the weather was lousy all the time. You know, it was like freezing, and I'm not used to that. And then it was, summer was hot and humid and cloudy all the time. It was like, well, it's a good weather, like Brisbane. You know? But gradually you get used to it, and eventually you settle. And I've been here now about 28 years, so I don't consider myself Japanese, and no Japanese would consider me Japanese, but uh, it's home now. Australian, you've got a very unique perspective on the region, the border Asian region. What's Australia doing right in the border Asian region? If I think about what is Australia doing right regarding the Asian region, I'd say recognising the obvious which is that this is the key region for the world for the next hundreds of years. You have got powerful economies here already. You've got developing economies which will be powerful economies here. You've got a commonality throughout the region around the importance of education. You've got young youth populations which are large which are going to grow into big consumer populations. You've got an openness to change in those economies because they, they're hungry, they want to grow. And so I think Australia, the tyranny of distance has become the opportunity of distance for our country, which is a really big mental change from where we were in the 60s when that phrase came out. Right? So that's what we're doing, right, to be luckily, geographically, located where we need to be. So I think that's recognising the obvious is a really good thing. Doing something about it and doing something that's productive about it, different question. What is Australia not doing so well in the Asian region? So if I think about what are we, where are we lacking, what are we not doing well enough, or where can we do better? Well, we can recognise that Asia is the key engine for economic growth, the powerhouse for the next couple of centuries. You can recognize that, but you've got to be part of it. You can't be some outpost of Europe sitting at the bottom, if you can think we're the bottom, maybe we're the top, I don't know. Depends how you look at the globe uh, of Asia. You know, we've got to be part of it. Now, we talk a lot about engaging with Asia, I don't like that term particularly because it's got a certain distance built into it as a word. Engage is like I'm over here 
and I engage with you over there, I prefer the word integrate, because that's got that more intermingling, intermingling between us and the countries of Asia. And so I think Australia has to be open at a number of levels to really work well with Asia. And so every, every Asian country is different. They are not a model if called Asia. They're actually quite different economies that need special attention, need particular care, I think. But you look at, uh, for example, there's a big struggle session now going on in Australia about Indonesian studies, Indonesian language studies. It's fading out. You know, um, we don't teach Korean uh, very much in Australia. We teach Chinese. We teach a bit of Japanese. We don't teach Thai. You know, we don't. We have a lot of Vietnamese uh, immigrants in Australia, which is a great base. But you know, there's not enough integration, as I said before. And I think a big part of that is basically business. I think has to really change their mindset. We're in a bit of a tricky situation. And I'll give a contrast with New Zealand. When I was at Austrade, I noticed a very big difference between New Zealand companies and Australian companies. New Zealand companies had absolutely no doubt they had to be global. Their mentality was global. But with Australian companies, there was still that illusion Ah, well, you know, the Australian economy is big enough. You know, it's 20 million something people. It's a, a big enough economy. We don't have to really be global. We, to stay in Australia, we'll be, we'll be right, mate. She'll be right, mate. It was a type of mentality. That's an illusion. That's an absolute illusion. New Zealand's got it right. Four million people, they get it. We're a little bit sort of 22. We're not quite getting enough. I think companies, businesses have to realise Australia has to really know Asia. That means you've got to have people living there, speaking the language, really integrated into those economies, those societies, who can then work in those Australian companies to help the companies access the business that's going to be on offer there. Because Australia has a rule of law, we have you know, fantastic technology, we have really well-established educational systems, we've got English as our core language, we've got so many advantages that we can apply in Asia, but you've got to have the people on the ground to do that. Are companies investing in those people? Like you have cadets to learn how to become draftsmen or architects, or you have people who go into companies um, to become, you know, trained in the companies, but they don't think the same way of training young people who are coming back from Asia or getting them to go to Asia and then have them as an integral part of the company and keep those people in the company to become the future leadership of those companies. That part of the puzzle is missing. So for people who are studying about Asia, how do they get a job? How do they get a significant job that's going to be important for that company, important for their careers? There's still a breakdown there between the educational system, what it's producing, and the short-sightedness of companies and what they're prepared to do about investing in the product of those universities to make them the centerpiece of that Asian integration going forward. There's an interesting perspective from Australia looking to integrate into Asia. Given your position here, can you give us any insight into the Asian perspective on integrating with Australia? I think Australia, if you look at it from the Asian point of view about being, uh, having an integration process I talked about before, there's not a big interest. You know, I mean, we, we are the suitor here, I think. We have to be very clear about that. They don't need us as much as we need them. But you would never know that living in Australia. You'd never know that reading the Australian media. I think we've, we've got to get our heads around this, that they have got big populations. They are often sharing borders uh, as a common landmass. You know, we've got the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Taiwan, Japan, uh, as sort of island uh, archipelagos uh, or islands sitting off this Asian landmass, basically. Um, so they've got natural advantages, a bit like Europe, if you think about it, like Europe is a common landmass. So they can develop and grow their economies quite happily as they go forward. They don't necessarily need Australia. You want to get iron ore? Brazil. Truckloads of the stuff. You know, you can get it from there. You want to get coal? China's got lots of coal. You know, there are lots of countries producing the same sort of resources we have where you can source those types. Of LNG? Indonesia. Got tons of the stuff. So, you know, we have to be a bit smarter around the integration part is for our benefit, actually. And we are the suitor. We have to be the ones who bring something to the party here that makes the whole equation work. Yeah. Why is Australian integration with Asia so important? 
Well, you ask me why is Australia's integration with Asia so important? It's in our best interest. We need them a lot more than they need us. They are the growth engine, not us. But we could be part of them. What will happen if Australia doesn't effectively integrate with Asia? If we don't effectively integrate with Asia, we will just be a small continent sitting at the bottom of Asia with a uh, European-based population that's growing slowly and basically uh, exhausting its mineral resources and working its way into a basic oblivion. The term engagement with Asia is very popular, but you believe it's more about integration with Asia. Can you give us a quick idea of what that's about? Yeah, I, I hear the word engagement with Asia quite a bit. I, I prefer the word integration because Engagement has got a distance to it in terms of the semantics and the thinking. I think integration is more cooperative, it's more an intermingling, it's more win-win. What are the biggest challenges Australia face in integrating with Asia? Yeah, what are the challenges for Australia to integrate with Asia? I think we have to provide some value in that integration. And we have rule of law, we have a great educational program, we have English. You know, we are a modern society, we are advanced in so many areas. I think we can bring a lot in our, our interaction with those Asian economies through our businesses. What steps should someone venturing out to a business career, what should they have in mind when they're thinking about Asia? For someone who's about to start a career uh, thinking about that integration with Asia, get there. Pick the country you're going to and get there as fast as you can, learn as much as you can, Bring that back, find a company that can realise your potential and get the base from inside that company because it's very hard to do it from outside. What are the biggest challenges that the Asian region is going to face in the coming decades? I think we look at the Asian region as a total of what's the biggest challenge. I, I think it's going to be stability. Stability because, you know, if you think about China, for example, China has a history of waxing and waning. You have centralization of a strong central government, and then you have it sort of waning to regionalism. And it could just as easily uh, go back to a regional breakdown of central power and have strong uh, regional leaders who break China up. I mean, that's not impossible. That's actually not impossible. You've got the two Koreas. You could have a hot war right there at any time. Uh, I don't think China's going to invade Taiwan and take it back. I think that'll be a peaceful integration through uh, economies, basically. But you've got uh, China now interacting with the Philippines, interacting with Japan, interacting with Taiwan, interacting with Vietnam in a very friction-high uh, interface around uh, claims of territory. And if you look at maps of Asia, the Chinese territorial claim goes from China all the way down to about the middle part of uh, the Philippines. That is a hell of a lot of territory. So those friction points aren't going to change. Let's put you on the spot a bit. What are three things Australia could be doing right now to better integrate with Asia? How could Australia better integrate with Asia right now? The whole focus around the educational system, I think that's the right move. But I think to help get young people into companies with that expertise. So the education piece should be expanded and should continue, but there should also be a flow on to integrate into the companies with that expertise and also to use the expertise that's in the country already. Get young Asian people to come into Australia and be Australians and be also part of that interface. Just to go a bit lighter now, step back. Um, what do you like about living and working in Tokyo? What I like about living and working in Tokyo, this is the safest, most fast-paced, most exciting, most sophisticated capital in the world bar none. No other capital has that combination. Well, everything you want is in Tokyo. It's expensive, but it's here. And the best of everything comes here. Now, Japanese culture is very, very sophisticated. And so when you live here, you really begin to appreciate the nuances that exist here. It's a very polite culture. It's a very considerate culture. The Japanese have always had a high density of population. They've learned how to get on with each other. They've learned how to be considerate with each other. So it's, in that sense, a very comfortable environment. If 
you speak the language, it becomes even more comfortable. I mean, even if you don't speak the language, there are plenty of foreigners here who don't speak the language who live a very comfortable life. And there are a huge number of foreigners here who are illiterate, can't read Japanese, who live a very successful business life or personal life here. Like me, if you read, you speak, it just gets more and more fascinating and more and more deep into the culture. What are the, what are the challenges someone moving to Japan might face for, the first, for their first move? For someone first moving to Japan, what would be a big challenge? I think the language, obviously, the fact you can't read simple things, uh, the fast pace, uh, the way things work here. The decision making uh, is much more uh, considered and slow compared to maybe Australia. So what seems like a simple thing takes a long time. Uh, nothing seems to go the way you think it'll go because the logic seems to be operating off a different platform here. So your expectations are always confused uh, because it just operates with its own logic. It's got its own holistic logic which is different to yours. At first you think it's illogical, but later on you discover it's a different logic. What have you learned personally from living and working in Japan? Think about what have I learned personally from working and living here. I, I think. I'm married, uh, I've got a child here, my, my daughter's in Australia, stay here, but my son's here. I think having family here, my Japanese in-laws here, being that part of the society of, has taught me a lot more. My wife has taught me a lot about Japan. Uh, she's someone who is very international, but through her I've learned so much more, more and more levels there. I think uh, the essence of how to be good to each other, how to live together as a as a society. Um, there's a great advantage in being individual. There's also a great advantage in being collective. And I think uh, Japan could be a little bit more individualistic and Australia could be a little bit more collectivist, I think. And so the balance of those two, I, I think there's something ideal in that. On that point. So what could Australia learn from the way business is done here in Japan? Yeah, Australia could learn a lot from the way business is done here in Japan, I think, particularly around long-term view and long-term development of people. The Japanese companies see their people as the future growth engine for the organization, so they invest in them. And they invest in them in a way that keeps them in the company. Now we have greater social and uh, employment mobility in Australia than you have in Japan, I know that. But if you make the company attractive enough, people will stay. And I think that is something the Japanese companies reap the benefit by investing their people. I think Australian companies could do a lot more in that area. I think long-term strategy also is an area that Japanese companies are very advanced in. They tend to see a much longer horizon than maybe Australian companies do. We're driven by quarterly results, maybe not as much as the states, but increasingly so. And I think that's to the detriment of long-term strategy and planning. So there are two particular areas. I think that uh, maybe another one is uh, trying to uh, be a bit more open, I think, to fast-paced change. Japan has gone through a huge amount of change. Lost the war, devastation, uh, rebuilding. You know, Australia, I think, is going to go through a lot of changes too, and I think there's a certain amount of flexibility that the Japanese have shown through that process that I think we're going to have to learn as we go forward. Is there anything Japan could learn from what Australia does? On the other hand, how could Japan learn from Australia? Well, that's, I think, Japan could... Uh, we do a lot more around speeding up decision making. Uh, it's sort of a bit of a balance, isn't it? But I think there's too much uh, consensus decision making that's slow. Consensus decision making can be fine, but it needs to be a bit faster. I think uh, Japan can be a bit frustrating trying to get things done here because it takes such a long time to make decisions. Uh, so I think in that sense, Japan could speed things up a bit, would be good. I think also, uh, Japan is not really a multicultural society like Australia yet, and I think they could do a lot more to bring different people to have a labour shortage. Uh, they need to think about that a bit more carefully. They're trying to maximise women so they don't have to bring in foreigners, but I think eventually they'll have to bring in foreigners. And I think once they start doing that, it'll start to bring different perspectives. It's not total group think here, but it's pretty close to it because everyone's educated the same way, read the same media, have the same perspective more or less. I think having broader perspectives, greater insights, different angles on, on questions and issues would be much better. What are the opportunities for young people in Japan, young Australians at the moment in Japan? So opportunities for young Australians uh, here in Japan at the moment? Well, 
I think there are a lot. Uh, I think that this economy is starting to come out of deflation. I think it's starting to grow again. I think, therefore, work chances will improve. I think uh, we've had a bit of a departure of a lot of uh, foreign organizations after the burst of the bubble and after Lehman shock after the uh, earthquake, tsunami, and radiation problems. So I think they're coming back, and I think that's a good thing. I think that eventually um, rule of law is important. Japan has rule of law. There needs to be some certainty about you get your money back. And I think that will also prove to be attractive over the long term compared to some other countries like China, for example, where they don't have rule of law yet, and you're not quite sure about getting your money out in the long term. And so I think Japan's still going to be a, a, a powerhouse economy regardless it's big. It is very, very big. And so there is an opportunity for young people who can be part of Japanese companies now. That didn't exist before. The Japanese companies didn't think, oh, we should be employing young people from foreign countries because they're going to bring some sort of globalization internal to our organization. And they are thinking like that for the first time. So you're right there. You can be part of that process and become knowledgeable about how Japanese companies work, but also make them start to think about how to be global. What advice would you have for a student just finishing or is about to finish their, their bachelor degree and they're thinking about going overseas? Uh, what advice would I have for a young person just finishing their bachelor degree and think about going overseas? Go. Go. You're going to learn a lot more faster outside of Australia than you will in it. Uh, but you've got to have a plan. You know, you've got to be thinking, I'll give it X period of time and then I'll come back and I'll attack this or that. If you plan to stay in Australia, uh, because if you don't, you might wind up never coming back, that's possible. Or you may sort of wander from job to job overseas, but it never actually quite makes a career. Uh, that may also be an issue. So I think having some plan, it may change, but having a plan is a good thing to have as well. Even though you may need to be flexible about it, but really think, well, I'll give it X number of years unless there's a really strong opportunity to make me stay, in which case I will, or now's the time to go home and leverage what I've learned and put that into good practice. Just very quickly, uh, you received the Griffith Outstanding Honours Award. Can you just tell us briefly about how that came about? That yeah, I was very honoured to be chosen as alumnus of the year by Griffith University. Uh, I uh, never thought that the application uh, process would see me uh, coming through and being chosen. Uh, that, for me, was a great honour. I. I, I don't know, I, I have lots of classmates who are probably more deserving of that honour than I am. But uh, fortunately the selection panel thought that what I'd done was seriously enough. And I think it's a good recognition also for students to see the university considers. You are part of the university family for your whole working life and I think that's a great message too. Certainly uh, I was a first intake for Griffith and none of that stuff was in anybody's mind. But as the university matures and as I think we mature, those things become more important. What's, uh, what are your long-term goals? If I think about my long-term goals for myself, uh, it's a bit of a cliche, I know, but I really want to play that bridging role between Australia and Japan to help those societies, economies, organisations, the politics, etc., understand each other, those worlds to understand each other better. I, I think both sides have so much to offer each other. And I'm in a unique position that I have lived here for such a long time. You know, I have a PhD in Asian studies. I run my own company here. Uh, I can play that role. I work very closely as far as I ever have an opportunity with the embassy to help them where I can. And also, I, I try to always put Australia in the forefront of things that I do every chance that comes up to, again, to get Australia on the map uh, with Japanese organizations. So last question. So what's next for me? Uh, well, probably retirement, I guess, in, in some number of years. I mean, I, uh, I'm running my own company, so I don't have uh, uh, mandatory retirement age. But um, you know, the things that excite me are knowledge, learning, uh, challenging things. And so at some point, I'd like to take all the things that I've learned and assemble that into some format that helps, uh, that helps people, and particularly help people in Australia to understand Japan. So it might be retiring back to Australia, having the idea, which is half the year in Japan, half the year in Australia, that is absolutely the ideal. But in that process also play some sort of role, uh, be it a non-profit or be it teaching or be it just uh, doing something that I, I can help both countries come together more closely. So you may yet go back to academia? 
Well, going back to academic life would be maybe ideal, although, you know, I think there's probably lots and lots of academics who are looking for uh, their careers to be further rather than having someone like me who's a uh, retiree coming in and taking up space. So maybe it might be uh, an unpaid position as a retiree, uh, and so I don't, uh, you know, I don't dilute the job opportunities back there, but I'd like to play some role where I can give back because, and certainly I'd love to be able to give back to Griffith because they've given me so much. If I hadn't been for Griffith, I would not be where I am today. No question. So if I can give back, uh, I'd love to have that opportunity. When I was uh, at the alumnus dinner receiving my award, I gave a presentation. I talked about, I don't think engagement is the ideal word for Australia in terms of thinking about Asia. I think integration is a better word. And in the question and answer, Professor Colin McCurris, my old professor from uh, Griffith, asked the question, well, Greg, what's the difference between engagement and integration? And it's a great, it's a great insight to think about what is the difference. And for me, engagement, yes, it means bringing together the two countries, the two societies, and to have a lot of interface. But it's got a certain aspect to it of distance, that we are this vast continent, uh, you know, sitting apart from this Asian landmass and, and island chains that sit off it. But we are sort of separate to that. The word integration for me has got a lot more intermingling. It's got a lot more of the yin-yang symbol. If you think about the yin-yang symbol, it's, a, it's this type of cupping where it's sharing more. And I think integration from that perspective says that we are part of Asia and Asia is more part of us. And that means both mentally and also uh, dynamically and physically through having, um, well, we see more and more Asian people living in Australia and we should see more and more Australians working throughout Asia than we see now. And I think uh, because of our population, we're not gonna have an impact in terms of living in a country as a, uh, as a, as a group, but we can have a big impact through working in Asia. So I think as Australians see their work careers as being Asia, including Australia, as an entity, that's integration. And I think as Asian countries see Australia as part of their extended family, and they see more and more of their relatives living there, and they see Australia as a destination that's home uh, to some extent to them as well, that that's integration. Whereas engagement is, well, we're in our little islands and we're sort of looking across the water to each other, you know. That's the difference between engagement and integration. I think for us, Integration is going to be a much richer future.